2022 uh, legislative session. Um, members, maybe a little housekeeping before uh, we go. Um, uh, why don't we uh, quick introduce ourselves? I know uh, we've got a new committee legislative assistant and um, let's make that quick as well as the pages. Uh, but why don't we start with, um, uh, with, with um, over here on my left, uh, Go ahead, members, just come around uh, counterclockwise. Oh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, yes. <laughs> Welcome. To Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. It's um, Aaron Murphy. Uh, the senator representing District 64 in St. Paul. Very good. And it's your turn. You're the you're one of the guys that's new. So introduce yourself to, to our committee, okay. please. Uh, ben Abrahamson, the CLA for Senator Westrom. And uh, S Senator Tory Westrom, uh, welcome to Ben and uh, the pages. Uh, any any new? We'll we'll get to you as well. But let's go through the rest of us. So uh, Ben, you get to know him as well as the pages and uh, any other new staff, uh, DFL or Republican side. Joel. I am uh, Joel Hansen. I'm the committee administrator for the Ag Committee. Uh, appreciate you bearing with us as we navigate these uh, new waters with hybrid hearings and, and coming back in person. So thank you very much. Senator Gary Dames, I represent Senate District 16, which is six counties in Southwest Minnesota. Senator Bruce Anderson, uh, represent Wright County and a little bit of Hennepin County, Senate District 29. And uh, this is uh, my first time on this Ag Committee, but uh, I've been on it many times in, in the state legislature before. Thanks for be allowing me to be here, Tori. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Jean Dornick, District 27. Good afternoon, Senator Mike Ogden, District 21. Members, uh, uh, Senator Eakin, we'll go to you on the Zoom and anyone else, uh, any other members on Zoom? Well, thank you, Chair uh, Westrom. Uh, uh, Kent Eakin, State Senator for District 4, that's uh, Norman and Clay Counties and a part of Becker County. All right, uh, welcome Senator Eakin. Uh, Senator French, did we bypass you? No, you didn't, Mr. Chair, but uh, thanks for having me. My camera's not working, um, but I'm Nick Frentz, representing District 19, all of Nicollet County and part of Lesseur and Blue Earth County, and glad to be back on the Senate Agriculture Finance Committee. Good to have you back. Uh, so Pages, uh, who do we have? If you can introduce yourselves, just... Ashley Fowler, welcome. Kaya Murphy, Callie Murphy, welcome to our committee. And uh, you know, uh, on the Republican side, we still have Andrew Larson Research. Andrew, and he's in the back. And uh, DFL, yep. same research. Jackie Clinton. Is anybody else uh, on the DFL side? Uh, uh, yes. Hi, Senator. Uh, <laughs> Vice Chair. Um, Vice Chair CLA, just spotlighting here. And uh, members, one uh, uh, one new addition also is uh, our uh, Senate Council. Laura, are you? Hello, Senator. I'm Laura Painter. I'm the new legislative analyst. I'm glad to be here. So members, uh, Laura is uh, uh, replacing Greg Kanoff. Uh, we welcome her aboard uh, this fall. Um, Laura, just tell us a little bit more about yourself, a background, uh, grew up in Southeast Minnesota, I believe. And, uh, that's correct. As, um, as you know, um, you've got big shoes to fill. Oh, well, yeah. I, I don't know if I can call myself Greg's replacement, but, um, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, and, um, also spent some time in New Zealand doing environmental policy work. I finished a master of public policy last year, um, background in environmental policy, regional policy, historic preservation. And I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you, Laura. Welcome. And uh, also fiscal analyst, Hannah, why don't you just reintroduce us to your you as well? 
Sure. Hello, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Hannah Grunwald, and I'm the fiscal analyst on the Agriculture Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, any staff that I missed, please speak up. I think I've got it. Thank you all. Um, members, uh, we're going to start with the DNR and the report, but before we get into that, I just want to um, uh, take a little time. Uh, first of all, uh, Commissioner Peterson is on uh, joining us by Zoom today, uh, but members, uh, we uh, heard some very unfortunate uh, news from uh, Peter Chesset, uh, who's the Assistant Commissioner, um, and as the Ag Committee, we want to uh, just uh, let uh, Peter's family know, as you uh, have probably heard, uh, they lost their uh, young child uh, recently. And uh, uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, the Ag Department, uh, we express our condolences and sympathies. And uh, uh, members, uh, let's take a short moment of silence to think of Peter's family and Peter and his wife uh, with such a tragic loss. Uh, keep them in our prayers and let's take a moment of silence. Uh, briefly before we start uh, in recognition of uh, that uh, tough, sad situation. <laughs> Members, uh, please uh, keep them in your thoughts and prayers as you go forward. We know that's a very tough time. Uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, not to put you on the spot, but uh, any brief comment uh, we'd welcome uh, from your committee before we get into our agenda. Uh, welcome, welcome to our committee and welcome back, Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, and members, and thank you for uh, recognizing uh, the passing this past week of uh, of uh, Commissioner Chesset's uh, uh, young daughter Tova. Uh, it was. Uh, Quite a shock and unexpected. Uh, uh, less than two years old, and um, the services are tomorrow. And uh, there is a, a site we can share with you if uh, you'd like to uh, learn more. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. And and again, thank you for recognizing uh, this and uh, and Peter and, and his family. And and uh, we look forward to working with you this session. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Please uh, pass our condolences on to him and his family. Members, uh, next on the agenda, we'll uh, call on the DNR um, for, first of all, a report and an update on uh, no movement order on the deer uh, across the state of Minnesota this past October. Um, just to refresh everybody's uh, memory, we made a, a change last year in the final negotiations in the environment bill. Board of Animal Health has, uh, has had oversight of uh, the deer farms as well as other livestock in our state. The DNR was uh, brought on with some concurrent authority, some new dollars that went to uh, the DNR. And so that's the report we're going to get into next. Uh, but one of the, one of the, significant measures that was taken last fall uh, dealt with this uh, no movement order. And so we wanted to get an update on that from the DNR and then we'll uh, proceed into the report that was uh, given to us last week, February 1st. And then the, also the Board of Animal Health, uh, both, both uh, agencies to uh, give us an update on the report and how the concurrent authority is working. And then also we will hear from some of the deer farmers as well. So. Uh, with that, um, okay. Captain uh, Robert Gorick, uh, welcome to our committee. If uh, you can identify yourself for a record, welcome to the table. If you can uh, uh, proceed with the no movement order and an update for our committee, and then members will have questions at the end um, uh, and, and continue from there. So welcome, uh, identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, um, if you don't mind, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. I'd just like to make a few uh, introductory remarks and then turn it over to Captain Gorecki, talk about the deer movement, 
Uh, the third deer movement ban that we put into place, we've done this three times now. Uh, the latest one was, as you know, October 7th, and what brought us to that, what we learned, uh, why we lifted it, and talk about a little bit of our recommendations in our report that we learned from that stop movement order um, that leads into our recommendations. Uh, this slide is actually slide nine within our slide deck, if you're looking for it. Um, I was hoping to go chronologically from the passage of the law through concurrent authority into the stop movement order, into the recommendations. But Captain Grecki, who was a co-lead on our DNR concurrent authority work team, also Christian Blazer, uh, Balzer was also our, from our wildlife division, the other, other co-chair of our team. So with that, I will turn it over to Captain Grecki. Chair Westrom. Uh, Welcome, uh, thank you, uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. And uh, welcome to our committee as well. Dr. or uh, Captain Gorak. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair Westrom, committee members, thank you for having us. Uh, as you may know, on September 26, 2021, on or about, uh, the DNR was made aware of a Wisconsin deer farm that had imported deer to the state of Minnesota, as well as seven other states across the country. Uh, roughly 387 deer were imported in the last five years from that farm. So on October 7th, 2021, the DNR issued an emergency order uh, to prohibit the movement of white-tailed deer into the state of Minnesota, as well as around the state of Minnesota. This time was needed uh, to really get into all of the deer that were moved during that five-year period. Um, the Board of Animal Health, in consultation with them, had restricted movement on three deer farms in the state of Minnesota that had received deer directly from this farm in Wisconsin that had uh, CWD positive deer but there was a lot of other deer across the country that we had no idea where these deer went. If they've passed through the state of Minnesota, had passed through the deer farms across our state, uh, or uh, perhaps had other tags uh, issued when some, one got lost. So we really needed some additional time to look at all of these deer and reach out to our counterparts, not just with the Wisconsin uh, equivalent to the Board of Animal Health, the USDA APHIS, who also helps coordinate uh, deer movement and uh, CWD efforts, but the other states, Oklahoma in particular, we reached out to these states to find out if these deer did pass through to the best of their knowledge and ability. As you may well know, a lot of states do not track deer as well or differently than the state of Minnesota does. So a lot of these deer um, ended up being um, dead ends, if you will. But the deer that we could corroborate and identify uh, and confirm that they were not in the state. It took us roughly two months to do this. At that time, we had exhausted um, all reasonable efforts to find out where the rest of these deer went. And at that point, the commissioner on about December 2nd uh, issued an order to lift that temporary movement ban. Um, and then we'd reevaluate it with this legislative session. Thank you. Uh, Captain Gorky, is that the end of your? Yes, that's, that's for one. this one. This is slide nine. Like I said, we're going to go back afterwards and we'll go through our whole slide deck if, if that's acceptable. And is, is Dr. Karsten also going to want to have any comment on this part of the... Mr. Chairman, uh, she, her, her, her presentation is, is embedded after these slides. She will be presenting some information related to the recommendations after we could cover this subject. Oh, okay. Okay. So... Um, uh, Captain Gorecki or Captain or uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Meyer, uh, can you talk a little bit about the communications and the working with the Board of Animal Health on this uh, order and uh, what went into planning it and uh, deciding this was the re best route? Mr. Chairman, uh, members, I can address that, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, when we learned about this, this is similar as we've done with the previous past two stop movement orders. We began working with the Attorney General's office to pre prepare the documents to be posted in the state register. And as we had done two times before, we notified the Board of Animal Health, the Department of Agriculture, and others the day before it was posted in the state register. Standard procedure for what we've done for the previous two times. So, um, Commissioner Meyer, um, standard procedure to notify concurrent agencies the day before? Uh, was this a 
universal decision between the Board of Animal Health and the DNR, who had now concurrent authority to work together? Or can you talk on that a little bit more? Mr. Chairman, yes, I can. Actually, you need to rewind the clock six weeks before we were notified. The board knew of these animals six weeks before we learned about it in the newspaper. Um, so with that in mind, we needed to move quickly and rather quickly to get that done. And as I said, our procedures were to notify other state agencies after it was approved by the attorney general, the governor's office, the revisor, and being ready to be prepared and printed in the state register. So what, what was, and I guess we're, we'll hear from the Board of Animal Health too, but uh, I know you and I talked in, in October shortly after this, uh, but what was the response from the deer farmers and uh, what was the net result of, of this order being put into effect? Uh, did it accomplish what you were uh, set, it out, set out to accomplish or or, or not? Mr. Chairman, um, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, again, I think it accomplished more than what we set out to do actually by learning, as Captain Gorecki stated, not all states take chronic wasting disease as seriously as we are in Minnesota. Some states don't track, some states don't monitor, they don't have the information. State of Oklahoma, uh, there's two different agencies who don't have concurrent authority that split the responsibilities. And with that in mind, it leads to one of the main recommendations in the report that we should immediately prohibit the importation of any cervids into the state of Minnesota from any area within the country that has chronic wasting disease, be it a county, a local township, that whole state should be prohibited from coming into the state of Minnesota. We have 500,000 deer hunters. The impacts that the, the deer hunting community provides this state, not only on those weekends, but throughout the year, um, Without that, we will have a lot other bigger problems to deal with as auto crashes, other diseases, crop depredation. So it's imperative that we keep an active, uh, wild, healthy deer herd. And what we learned from the stop movement order is that there's a lot of gaps out there and we have you know, a few of the pieces we need to track these, this information, but there's not a complete system that you would have for bovine tuberculosis, for example, within the cattle herd. There, it just, it's not that sophisticated within the, the, the wild deer farm population. So community, I should say, across the states. So we, we, as soon as we learned, as Captain Gorecki stated, that there were a lot of dead ends out there. And I talked to your, your committee administrator about this as we were in the process of rescinding the rule. Uh, we began implementing the procedures to do so, which needs to be published in the state register. Unfortunately, during that, that time frame, we ran into the holiday, Thanksgiving holiday season, which delayed us um, because of the public publishing of the state register by a couple of days. We got it in there the week after. So had Thanksgiving not fallen into place there, we would have had it done a week earlier. The, and, and the date you're talking about, uh, Commissioner Meyer, I think went into effect on October 11th. Is that correct? It was effective October 7th. October 7th. Okay. And, and oh, I see. And I'm hearing from staff that we got, it was posted in the register on the 11th. So I guess I don't know the dates, but the, the went into effect the 7th. The 6th is when you notified the, your concurrent partner, Board of Animal Health. And uh, when did the governor's office know about this? Mr. Chairman, we had been working with the Attorney General's office, the Governor's office for approval of an emergency rule and the Revisor's office previous to that. So, um, Senator Dames has a question. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Myers. As I understand, it's kind of a joint powers agreement between, and I know that's not the correct term, but it'll get across my point, between the DNR and the Board of Animal Health. So my question to you is, when you consulted the Board of Animal Health, which would be our veterinarians, and should certainly have a pretty good insight on how this process works and to what this disease amounts to, uh, what kind of participation did you get? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor. Senator Dames, the board uh, act how, asked us how they could help get the, the message out. Actually, Captain Gorecki, 
worked with Dr. Glazer to, to send emails or letters out to the farmers who didn't have email to notify individual producers of the prohibition that was going into place. A follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. So what I'm hearing and understanding then is you're saying that you did consult with the Board of Animal Health prior to making those decisions to where they would have a time to weigh in on this decision. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, sir. Mr. Meyer. Chairman, Senator Dames, no. As I stated, the, this was the third stop movement order the department had put in place on the movement of white-tailed deer, farmed white-tailed deer. In each of those instances, we notified the Department of Agriculture and the Board of Animal Health on the day before the rule was published. We followed that same protocol during this timeline. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. So, Mr. Meyer, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the impression that both bodies have equal jurisdiction in this decision. And so I'm wondering why the other body was not chosen when I say both bodies, the DNR and the Board of Animal Health. So I'm wondering why that was not followed through with. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Dames. Um, in our review of concurrent authority, it doesn't say it has to be in conjunction with. The statute that is in the report that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor gives the DNR the same authority as the Board of Animal Health does in chapter 35.155 for the enforcement and movement of white-tailed, farmed wild white-tailed deer. So it doesn't say it has to be in cooperation in conjunction with. Now the report language said to work with in cooperation with the Board of Animal Health, which is exactly what we did. The signatures on the cover letters are from both Director Thompson, Commissioner Stroman. But because of the seriousness of this issue, we needed to move quickly and we wanted to make sure that it was enacted as efficiently as possible. So we followed the same procedure as we had done the previous two times we had issued stop movement orders. Well, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Sure, I do have some concerns about the interaction between those two boards. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Meyer, uh, just to touch on that, uh, you mentioned the two previous stop movement orders. Uh, were they done before the concurrent power or authority was given? And, and so, uh, am I correct in that? Mr. Chairman, yes, they were done given the, the commissioner's authorities in chapter 84 to protect wildlife. So we were protecting the wild deer populations from the threat of chronic wasting disease. We were brought, uh, we were sued, and actually the, the, the course was, case was dismissed. So we have, we have other authorities available as well. This rule was drafted using both our authority under chapter 35 and under chapter 97. If, uh, I can provide the committee with findings of fact from the statement of need and reasonableness from that report that outlines that very clearly. So, Mr. Meyer, uh, are you telling us today that the concurrent authority given to you last June wasn't needed for that uh, decision to move forward, and you don't see that as a, a part of your concurrent uh, authority uh, that, that was added to the DNR and uh, Board of Animal Health working together last summer? Mr. Chairman, that is not what I stated at all. What I'm saying is we have additional authorities in other parts of statute that the DNR has that give us authority to prevent, to protect the wild populations, protecting the wild deer herd from a disease that's contained within the farmed wild deer herd in this instance. And that was the basis of that finding. In fact, I will provide all three of the statements of needs and reasonableness to the committee for your review and you can go through in detail what we used. So, so I guess, Mr. Meyer, the, where I, the, the change made last June in the final budget bills uh, offering concurrent authority, was that helpful or necessary in what you did last October or not? That's what I guess I'm not clear on. Mr. Chairman, it was related. And those authorities, the concurrent authority that we've been given will now allow us to take over all of the inspections and enforcements of the farmed wild white-tailed deer in the coming months. So that was the big piece that we're successful with and we will be implementing here shortly. Did you, Mr. Meyer, uh, did you say you're gonna be taking over all the inspections of the farms in the coming months? Mr. Chairman, that is one of the recommendations in the report, yes. 
And Mr. Meyer, is that agree? That's part of the agreement you and the Board of Animal Health have made. Is that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I won't speak for the board, but it's my understanding that that's what they would like to see happen. Okay. Um, members, Mr. Meyer, maybe uh, I know the Board of Animal Health is here, uh, Dr. Thompson, and so maybe this would be a good time. I, I'd ask Dr. Thompson that question, and maybe uh, she could comment on a couple of the other questions I had. I want to get a clearer understanding of this uh, concurrent relationship. But Dr. Thompson, if you could come up, welcome to our committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record. And then, uh, Dr. Thompson, if you could talk to me about the question, and then Senator Goggin has a question. Um, Dr. Thompson, I guess uh, to dive right into this no movement order, uh, can you can you talk to us about the involvement the Board of Animal Health had uh, uh, in that process and uh, going forward, uh, what agreements are in place? The Board of Animal Health is. is not going to be doing any inspections uh, uh, going forward? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Beth Thompson, Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health and also the state veterinarian. Uh, if I remember uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer's testimony just a few minutes ago uh, about contact to the Board of Animal Health about the October 11th stop movement order, he is correct, it happened uh, actually, the night before, the, the call came in to me around 8.30 at night. And, and Dr. Thompson, uh, was that the first the Board of Animal Health knew about it, or was there members in the governor's office working with any of your staff on it, uh, just just not directly with you? Uh, had you, did, did you? Have you found out, or is, is there anybody else working on it? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, no, not to my knowledge, uh, governor's office or no others, we're, we're working with board staff on the stop movement order of October 11th. Yeah. Um, Senator Goggin has a question, then I'll come back and Senator Frentz uh, after Senator Goggin. Go ahead, Senator Goggin. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm gonna go back to uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer's uh, comments that he was making earlier, <clears throat> where he said the board knew six weeks prior to hearing of this in the news. I guess I'm trying to understand the timeline of how this all transpired. So I was hoping uh, maybe Doc, Dr. Thompson or uh, Commissioner Myers could uh, speak to that, please. Um, Mr. Myers, maybe I could have you up there at the table as well. Um, Senator Goggin, would you prefer Mr. Myers first or Dr. Thompson? Oh, either, either, either or, doesn't matter. I, I'm just trying to get an understanding of the uh, the timeline, and, and it struck me that okay. uh, to, that comment, I'd just like to get that clarified of how the board, is that the Board of Animal Health, or is that another board? Who, who knew six weeks prior uh, to all this? And it sounded like to me that uh, the DNR was surprised by, the, um, by that, uh, or caught off guard by just hearing it in the news. So okay. I was hoping we could Dr. get a Thompson, clarification any, of that. Uh, can you enlighten Senator Goggin and us a little more on the six week prior on, and Mr. Meyer, um, if you could clarify that, but go ahead, Dr. Thompson first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Goggin. That is an important piece of the, the whole timeline here. On a, August 13th of Friday, the Board of Animal Health received trace notification from uh, it's called DATCAP, Department of Trade, Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection in Wisconsin of a uh, handful of animals, white-tailed deer moving into Minnesota from a CWD positive herd. Now these animals are considered exposed. It doesn't mean that they're positive. It means they were part of a herd that had CWD. This is standard practice for animal agriculture, whether it's TB or CWD, states will notify other states of trace animals. Uh, we received from Wisconsin uh, for the five animals, official identification, um, the date of movements that they, they came into the state of Minnesota and also the location that was reported back to that farm and also to the Wisconsin 
uh, Department of Agriculture. It's part of a certificate of veterinary inspection. Whenever animals move across state lines, they need to have that CVI is what we call it for short. Uh, veterinarian signs off and includes all of that information. So in answer to your question, first, first date, August 13th, we received that in. Uh, within a few hours, our staff had completed that trace uh, of the five animals, a couple were already dead. And I think a couple moved back into Wisconsin and there was at least one animal still standing in Minnesota. So we quarantined that herd. Uh, USDA paid indemnity for that animal. It was uh, euthanized and tested and it was negative. The one thing the Board of Animal Health did not do was notify Department of Natural Resource of this trace from Wisconsin. So that's, that's the piece that leads up to uh, this, this herd being reported out in a newspaper, I believe, and then folks picking up on that from the newspaper. But again, this is not, with CWD, I think in the last year, there has been approximately 30 new herds across the United States. Um, so it's not uncommon to receive traces, but yes, the, the Board of Animal Health did not notify our concurrent partner, Department of Natural Resources. Senator Goggin, a, a follow up to that, otherwise Mr. Meyer, I'll ask him for comment. Uh, I guess my question would be, if, would, would it have been something you should have done out of courtesy to notify the DNR uh, in regards to this? I, I just, you know, for open communications between their concurrent partner, Mr. Meyer, why don't you uh, com okay. comment? To Mr. Chair, I, I'm Dr. Thinking, Thompson, go ahead. I, I, I'm thinking he probably meant that for me. And yes, uh, Senator Goggin, the, the Board of Animal Health, out of common courtesy, uh, should have included the DNR in that work that we were doing that afternoon. Um, there are many pieces of the program that we haven't exactly combined the two agencies with concurrent authority and both agencies are working on, but yes, as a common courtesy, the DNR should have been notified that afternoon. I don't have anything any, any further, Mr. Chair. Senator Goggin. I'm good. So, so Mr. Meyer, just to drill down a little bit more on the six weeks that we're talking about here, uh, what's your recollection of the situation and uh, did that lead to any of the October uh, emergency order uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Bob Meyer, as I stated previously in my testimony, when we learned about it in the Milwaukee Central, I think it was the Milwaukee Journal paper, um, we were immediately concerned, not only because of the one deer standing here, but where the rest of that Wisconsin deer population went statewide, nationwide, and how those animals may circle back into Minnesota. Numbers could change. Some states don't really track records like we do, Oklahoma being one of them, and that's where we ran into some really concerns with Oklahoma. Um, so, as I stated previously, our, our standard procedures on the previous two um, stop movement orders were to be getting all of the work done and notify our stakeholders and partners before it was published in, in the state, reg state register. So, Dr. Thompson, um, how many of the animals, the five animals that came to Minnesota did we not know of their location or the information on the other deer herd by time October emergency stop order? Did, did I hear you correctly? In, in, in August, you did a trace. Uh, in hindsight, letting the DNR know of that trace information would have been a good thing, but you found out within days where the deer were? Or can you explain that a little bit more? I think I heard you uh, right, but I wanted to make sure that that's what I heard. Yeah, certainly, um, Mr. Chair, members, the information from the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture came to us via email on August 13th, Friday the 13th, and uh, within two to three hours, with the information that came to us, again, it was where the, the animals had been sent in Minnesota, their official identification. And then also, um, I believe there was some other information that was contained in the email, but because we track individual animals by official identification, we were able to confirm that a couple of the head had already been 
um, killed. A uh, couple of them actually went back to Wisconsin. And then there was one animal that was still standing in the state of Minnesota, is my understanding. It's my understanding. There were five head total, but they were either dead, moved back to Wisconsin, and then one was still standing. And that was the one we had to uh, bring USDA again and get indemnity for. And, and so Dr. Thompson and then Senator France has a question. So, so by October 11th, when the ban was in place, we already knew where those five that came to Minnesota were at or what the status of them were. Is that, is that correct in a nutshell? Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes. And, and Dr. Thompson, is that standard procedure with livestock or is this just unique to deer? Uh, how do they track cattle, pigs, turkeys? Or maybe, I, don't, I mean, how, how, do they, how do they handle this or is this unique to deer? Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, this is standard trace work that is done across all species. If it's uh, tuberculosis in cattle, um, hogs move in groups, so they will have a group ID versus individual official identification, but it's still considered official identification. Uh, sheep, when we track scrapie, uh, that's official identification, individual animal identification. So it is standard, standard procedure for livestock tracing for disease purposes. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. You know I'm a fan of the work that the Board of Animal Health does, and I think it's provided tremendous value to um, the health of the herds statewide, and that's not just true of deer. My question is, how do, how's concurrent authority working? I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit here in this hearing about where we've been. I'd like to hear a little bit more from you, Dr. Thompson, about where we're going. And in particular, we want to stop the spread of CWD. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the concurrent authority and the way it's worked and the way you think it's going to work? I know the board has some other stuff on its plate, um, including in some other uh, producers' concerns, um, and I just want to know what you think, if you don't mind sharing. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. Dr. Thompson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Friends, thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm not sure if you want... Um, Mr. Chair, the agencies to get into presentations because I do have a presentation with some of those those um, answers. I hope to the, that question. Okay, and, and and Senator French, if you're okay, I, you read my mind. I didn't say it, but I I knew we're coming to it after the deer farmers presentation, Senator French. I think that's best. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I'm thinking maybe it. maybe that'd be a great question to keep in mind, and then we move into the presentations um, of, of the report. Uh, following the comment from uh, deer farmers. Uh, Senator Dorant, to the testifiers of the situation issue right in front of us now. Yes, Mr. Chair. Senator Dorant, go ahead, and then we'll uh, ask Gary Olson, uh, one of the deer farmers, to come up. Or, or are they joining us? So, Dr. Thompson, I just have a question about uh, being vet you're being a veterinarian, and uh, it sounded like there's five animals. And so with the, the actions that was taken, uh, what is the scientific um, support that the DNR did? Uh, was uh, um, you know, how big of a concern was it to you, and what uh, do you feel like that action was aggressive, over you know extending or or not? Uh, yep. Senator. Uh... Dornick, is it, was that to Dr. Thompson or Do yeah, Mr. Dr. Mike? Thompson? Dr. Yes. Thompson. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, that um, if I may, and if the chair would indulge me, um, my and, and I'm speaking on behalf of what I understand the DNR concern was with the situation. It wasn't the five animals, rather, it was the other animals that had moved out of that farm in Wisconsin to other states. Um, Again, thinking about traceability and the fact that all animals have official identification. Think about it as a driver's license. Think about it as a social security number. It's a number that stays with that animal for life. And it's a number that when that animal lands in certain spots, when it's, when it's bought, when it's sold, when a, a veterinarian writes out a certificate for it, that, that animal ID is tracked. And it's also brought into, in, in our state, the Board of Animal Health. So we have a, a very robust traceability system. We have a very robust database that tracks all of these animals. So in this circumstance, um, for animals to move into, say, 
South Dakota, and then bounce back into Minnesota. Um, when animals are traced, when they go into South Dakota, those traces go to South Dakota. Wisconsin gets a hold of South Dakota. Um, if South Dakota finds out that that animal then moved into Minnesota, then it's up to South Dakota to let Minnesota know. That, that, that is the whole system. If we were, the Board of Animal Health were responsible for looking at all traces going into all states, that would quickly just grind us to a halt. Because we, we, when you think of the thousands of animals that come out of TB traces in Texas, that, that, that's not the way the traceability system works. Instead, it goes state by state. And, and in addition to that, um, Wisconsin as the origin herd had already gotten back information on the traces coming out of these other states. So it's kind of a twofold with states work on the traces that they get and move them on if, if the animals did in fact move on to a new state. And in addition to that, the origin state keeps track of all of this too. Senator, did, Senator did, did, I, did I? No, I got it. So follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Dronick. So I guess uh, my question is, how can we make it so we can communicate better? Because it sounds like the communication with the DNR was not quite right. And then the DNR kind of, so how can we make, or is there anything we can do or um, something we've learned from this so that uh, uh, we can work together? We're all on the same team. We want to do what's right for Minnesotans. So how can we better do that and work together to, to solve this problem? And so if you have any suggestions or have anything we can help to do that. So Dr. Thank Thompson. You. And, and, uh, and Mr. And Chair, some of that Senator Dornick will probably get into in the report, but go ahead if you want to briefly. Uh, just just very briefly, we all know that communication needs to be worked on. Uh, we do it every day. We just had we just had a Board of Animal Health and Department of Natural Resources meeting this morning, so it's just working on that communication and getting that going, Senator. Thank you for the question. So, 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 so Dr. Thompson, Thompson, while you're here, um, and uh, before we move on to the, the deer farmers. Scientifically, would you implement this emergency order and recommend it to the DNR as a way to, to uh, deal with the situation that we had? Uh, sounds like we knew up front, and either the DNR should have asked if they didn't understand tracing, or you should have told them. Uh, but it seems like one of those two things would have solved a lot of the problem. How, how scientific, how, how many times do you do this stop emergency orders as a way to, um, track livestock. Mr. Chair um, and members of the committee, I cannot remember instituting a stop movement order. Now it's not something that uh, the Board of Animal Health would do, nor do we have the emergency powers to do that. Um, I think that's the best I can answer your question, Mr. Chair. And, 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 and so Dr. Thompson, um, did did that no movement order provide the information the DNR was looking for, or what did if it didn't? And I'm going to ask Mr. Meyer. I, Mr. Meyer, I'm asking you the same question. Yeah, and and so, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, one one point that I didn't bring up in this whole the the timeline was that. Um, the Board of Animal Health also contacted Wisconsin and got the whole list of official identification that came out of that, or the, the CWD positive herd. And we ran it against the data that was in our, our database and came up again with only the five animals that we already knew about um, had been sent to Minnesota. So the Board of Animal Health with the information that we had we're confident that no other animals had moved into the state of Minnesota unless they had been moved illegally. Mr. Meyer, same question. Mr. Chairman, uh, while that information may have been there, we wanted to go back and retrace it. We looked at that information that the board had received. We had contacted Wisconsin as well worked with other states. When we started working with Oklahoma, and I could have Lieutenant Garecki go into this in greater detail, or Captain Garecki, I should say, 
he is uh, was one of the ones responsible working on our trace out with those other states and other law enforcement agencies in those states. Um, we rapidly realized, or we began to realize that a lot of these animals were dead ends. They had either died or they weren't tested or they're just missing because states didn't, didn't confirm the data. As soon as we started uncovering that, we began the timeline to rescind the rule. So that's when I had reached out to your staff, let them know what was going on, what we had reached, and trying to work with the timelines at the state register to, to rescind and lift that movement order in an efficient manner. So basically your question is, did we learn what we want to learn? No, what we learned is that there's a lot of problems out there. This information, though it may be numbers on pieces of paper, um, you know, there's other ways to move these animals around. I'm not gonna get into those things, but we need to make sure that we're, we're only bringing in animals that we know are safe as we would do with any other of our livestock within our agricultural industry. So when we learn that, I mean, we'll get into this in our recommendations. It, it leads us into the work that we began in working with on in the final recommendations of the concurrent authority report. So, so Mr. Meyer, and then we'll move to the testifiers. Uh, is there a reason the DNR didn't ask their concurrent partner if they had any information on the deer you were concerned about in the first place? uh that that they could trace sounds to me like maybe you didn't even know that they traced animals uh is there a reason they didn't ask him back in august or early september mr chairman it was a matter of efficiency and implementability we wanted to make sure that rule was able to be implemented without people getting under the wire and moving animals before it was implemented La last question then mr meyer do you think that's a uh, a policy you're going to want to continue to work uh, with concurrent authority of Board of Animal Health? Is that is that a takeaway, Mr. Chairman? Uh, when we get into the recommendations of the report, one of them is to is to stand up a new memorandum of understanding that will deal with communications and how these issues will be dealt with going forward. So there is lessons learned uh, in the past six months from both agencies, or the board and the department, I should say. And we're looking to implement those and move forward to, to make sure we can protect Minnesota's wild deer herd and have a safe farmed wild deer population within the state of Minnesota as well. Very good. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Meyer and uh, Dr. Thompson and uh, Captain Gorecki. Uh, don't go far away. Uh, we've got uh, three testifiers, uh, uh, deer farmers, and then we want to get into the report to so members uh, uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, Mr. Gary Olson, uh, please uh, give us about two minutes of testif uh, testimony on, on your situation and uh, comments on the, the, the situation we've been hearing about. And then uh, we'll continue th with two more uh, testifiers from deer that, that have deer that are deer operators. And, uh, and then we'll go back into the report. Mr. Olson, welcome, identify yourself for the... I'm Gary Olson. I'm a deer farmer and a general farmer in southeast Minnesota. I, I live in the endemic zone in Fillmore County, just outside of Lanesboro. Um, for what we see, you know, being in a farming business for 50 years and deer farming for 24, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like this. This concurrent authority isn't working. I mean, I, I mean, we've worked with the Board of Animal Health for over 50 years on dairy, registered dairy Holsteins and imported cattle from Europe. And we, we had great success. We stopped diseases, but uh, as far as bringing the DNR into this thing, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, we're seeing recommendations that you're going to be seeing coming up here that, that just don't make any sense. And at, at, the, at the very end of all this, you know, they talk about everything needs to be science based. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the United States Animal Health Association for the last eight years, and I serve on the wildlife disease and certified committees, uh, farm certified committees at, at USA. And uh, just none of this stuff is science backed. I, I just don't understand. You know, they, they talk about uh, like if we do get CWD fencing for 20 years, uh, keeping our fencing in place. I mean, where, where does that come from? When, uh, when we were involved in, in Washington at USDA, uh, when we made the standards program, uh, the maximum, the USDA attorney said that the maximum of any government agency could tie up land is five years or it's construed as a taking. And in the state of Iowa, Brackey versus Iowa, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court and Iowa Supreme Court said that the state had no authority to quarantine land even, even for five years. 
but uh, there's just a lot of discrepancies. And, and if you look at this, these are all DNR recommendations on the whole last half of this 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 journal here. Um, and part of this thing is if, if, if there's deficiencies at the Board of Health, why didn't we, you gave the DNR two and a quarter million dollars to, to do this concurrent authority. I mean, did anybody really do the math on that? There's 3,300 deer in the state of Minnesota on commercial deer farms. That's almost $700 a deer for administration. For my farm this year, we had a DNR officer come out with our Board of Animal Health and everything went well, but he was there two hours. Well, with 200 deer, 195 deer, our, our administration costs for that two hour inspection was $130,000. So, I mean, would, would that money be better spent giving it to the board of, the board of animal health budgets under $6 million. So you're given almost a third of that to the DNR just to manage a co-current co authority. You know, if, if there's a deficiency at the board of animal health, just, just give them more money to do it and let one agency take care of it. This concurrent authority don't work. They don't work well together and um, give it to the Board of Animal Health, the veterinarians that actually understand diseases. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, can you remind us where you're from? Where, where's your farm again? Um, I'm in Fillmore County. Fillmore. And, yeah, we're near Lanesboro. Uh, we're near the hot zone. I've got positive deer outside my farm within three miles. Um, and we made suggestions to the DNR down our local staff. I mean, we're still seeing roadkill. I just drove by roadkill today. And, and no, they're not being picked up. Um, you know, we, we sit here looking at the audit to the Board of Animal Health that they had deficiencies. Well, when is the audit to the DNR gonna step into this? You know, I mean, we're sitting here nitpicking the Board of Animal Health that they didn't do this, didn't do this. Well, what is the DNR not doing out there? You know, we, we look at Houston County where I'm only 20 miles from there. We saw dumpsters overflowing with positive deer on the ground in a truck stop. And, after, and I was down there the day afterwards when it rained two inches and the water run right off that ground where there was blood and carcasses laying and went into a water reservoir right next to the place and nobody cared. Yet we go up to Beltrami and high fence, spend $194,000 to put up a half a mile of fence. And yet we don't care in Fillmore County what's going on. I mean, if it's the disease, you know, it's if it, the disease is the same disease inside our fence as it is outside our fence. So let's deal with it. You know, we're still seeing vehicles coming in and out of these truck stops. Uh, anything we do with butchering animals has to be in liners. When they leave our butcher plants in Wisconsin, our deer, everything's got to be in liners. Yet those dumpsters down there were not lined. There's juices falling out. They did, you know, the garbage trucks come in, pick them up, dump them in the garbage truck and go down the road. Well, what's, what's, what's being dumped on the highway going down there with trucks going down, car vehicles moving prions down the road? I mean, this, this just doesn't make sense. What you guys are... You're, everybody's picking on the Board of Animal Health on this thing, and we're not seeing any response from the DNR on, on, on management, and they, they pretty much failed in Southeast Minnesota. I'm gonna tell you from what I, I've lived there my whole life, and the CWD spread all across Southeast Minnesota right now, and it's, they're not stopping it. So wh why are we picking on the Board of Animal Health on this? I, I, don't, I just don't understand what's, what's going on as, as a farmer. I mean, I, I go back into the dairy industry, and like I said, I am supposed to import cattle from Europe, and I was, I was in the mad, I was quarantined for 15 years for mad cow disease. I was in England back in the nineties. We were bringing cattle back and forth from Europe. So, I, I mean, I understand a lot about the prion system. So um, I, I just don't get what's, what, what we're doing to the board of animal health here right now. If, if, if you guys are, are worried to get that two and a quarter million dollars, give it to the board of health, let them do their job, let them get more staff and then get rid of the Concord authority because it's, it's not gonna work. I can tell you that right now. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Appreciate you coming. Uh, Stan Porter, or Steve Porter, Steve Porter. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Melissa Ucatel will be on deck if you want to come up uh, right after. Uh, Steve. Mr. Porter, welcome. A couple minutes. Can you keep your testimony too? And uh, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, identify yourself uh, first for the record. Sure. My name is Steve Porter. I'm a deer farmer. Started raising deer in Kitson County, northwest corner of the state in 1992. I just retired from law enforcement, retired as from the position of sheriff. And I, I built a farm for my boys to take over. These movement bans, one thing they're not telling you is the Board of Animal Health recognizes that I have a closed herd, which means that I haven't bought any deer, brought new deer onto my farm for about 10 to 15 years. I have a closed herd. I don't have any chance of getting CWD. 
when the DNR decides to do a ban on movement, they shut me down. I call Bob Meyer and I say, Bob, I have a, a one of my, I only get paychecks so many weekends a year when I have my entertainment business and I'm gonna go to a sports show in Little Rock, Arkansas. I have a closed herd. I've tested 140 animals. I need to be in Arkansas. And he says, well, the ban is running for 30 days and uh, you can't go. They've, ad they've advertised 40,000 brochures that I would be there. My live box would be on display. It, it's irrelevant that I have a closed herd. I've had zero contact with sales from any other state or even within the state for about 12 to 15 years. I'm under a lockdown. Bob says you can go after the 30 day ban. Well, the sports show will have one day left. Forfeit your income, it doesn't matter. I'm out a lot of money. I've lost credibility with all of my vendors that I do sports shows at all across the upper Midwest. I've lost credibility. They print 40,000 brochures that say I'll be there. I can't come, I'm in a lockdown, I'm caught up in something. We do not fight disease this way. We don't paint with a broad brush. When we had, when we had uh, TB up in Skyme, they, they had an appropriate response. They went up there and they got after the cows and the deer that had TB, but they didn't shut down livestock producers in the opposite corner of the state. But the DNR wants to come in, and in my humble opinion, it's a hostile, vengeful act to just say, sorry, forfeit your income, you're done. You're not going. This fall, under their ban, they sent game wardens to my, to my vendors to knock on their doors, harass my customers, and tell them if you let the deer on the property, there's gonna be tickets written. The deer will not come to this, this event. Steve Porter is gonna get a ticket. They harass the building owners. If the store owner says, yes, he's bringing his deer, he'd violate your order. Then they, then they harass the building owner. They've harassed my customers. So right now I'm telling you, my entertainment business is dead. They have effectively killed it. And if you were to tell me today, hey, we can fix this. We can reel in the DNR and, and, and be peaceful. And you can run a agricultural business in peace and follow the rules set up by the Board of Animal Health. I would tell you it's too little, too late. My business is dead. I have my animals right now on a, on a maintenance diet. I'm feeding them sunflower screenings at $40 a ton and beet pulp. And now I'm due for an inspection this spring. And they say, we're sending a warden onto your property. I worked in law enforcement for 30 years. What happened to search warrants? I never agreed to for forfeit my, my, my rights, but yet they're forfeited and they're sending game wardens licensed on my property. Total violation. I could talk to you for an hour about the constitutional violations. So they're going to come and do an inspection this spring. I'm supposed to let my rights be gone and, and let an inspection occur with a licensed officer. Do you know of a pig farmer in the state or a cattle farmer or a turkey farmer who has to let a licensed officer on the property to do an inspection? I don't, I don't know of it. This is absurd. My business is dead. I got my animals on a maintenance diet and I have to make a decision. Do I start slaughtering my animals and throwing them in a pit? Do I keep my animals and hope to have a business? Do I invest more money in my business? Do I invest in better fencing, better buildings, better infrastructure, do I upgrade a tractor? I can't make one improvement because my business is being held hostage by the Minnesota DNR. I've got a son sitting in the, over here in the side with his wife. They built a house on my farm. 300 yards from me, they built a house. They planned on farming deer for 50 years. We follow all the rules. We've done everything right. We've tested 140 animals for CWD. He's living in a house without sheetrock. He doesn't know if he's gonna have a job. He's, he's supposed to do what now? He's put roots down in a farming community and we've been under attack by the Minnesota DNR. And in my humble opinion, it's hostile. Last thing I wanna say, in 30 years of law enforcement, you guys, I've probably been to 30 suicides. That's what I've done as an officer. And it was graphic and it was ugly. I never understood the mentality. My phone's been ringing off the hook from young deer farmers who don't know how to make their feed bills who don't know how to make their loan payments, who don't know how to do anything. And Bob Meyer will sit up here and tell you, we're just trying to fight disease. He knows, he knows he's painting with a broad brush. He doesn't care. Their goal isn't to fight disease. In my opinion, it's to obliterate deer farms. And, and they're succeeding. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Thank you for uh, driving all the way down. That's uh, it was a six hour drive. I, I, I go halfway there to get home. So I, yep. <laughs> you're, you're halfway home when you go by my- We're caught my, between a rock and a hard spot. What do we do with yeah. our animals right now? What do we do with them? So, so um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Porter, 
Melissa, if you want to come up uh, sure. just while he's doing that, uh, Mr. Porter. So uh, if I understood you right, they went to your customers out of state. They went to uh, uh, and, and talked to them and harassed them, they, quote unquote, no, using your they, language. I asked if I could go to Little Rock. They wouldn't give me permission to drive from my house to Drayton, North Dakota, 25 miles. Bob said, you cannot drive. Although you're licensed through USDA, although you have an import permit to exhibit in Arkansas, you have all the right paperwork. We're not going to let you drive from your house to Drayton, North Dakota. You can't drive 25 miles because we're controlling CWD. But in three more days, then you can, Steve. But none of my animals would be tested for anything. Nothing would change with my animals. It's just let the, let the ban expire, then you can go. And, and so I understand Drayton, North Dakota is where the deer are? Or no, I'm in, in Kitson County and I had to drive on Minnesota soil to get to right, North Dakota. To to then Drayton I would have been on the freeway there. And then I would have been legal on I-29 all the way south to Little Rock. And I can't get permission to go on and, and so 20 miles of US soil. The ban is lifted now. And so you could go under the I can go now, situation. but I can't. None of my sports shows, sports shows are over. No, they don't want to talk to me because they're telling me, Steve, you've lost credibility. Your credibility is destroyed. We print, we printed 40,000 brochures that you'd be here. We you can't failed to fulfill your contract. Why would we put faith in you again? We, we advertise a year in advance. We lock in our entertainment. Sure. So now I don't have credibility. I've lost all my sports shows. So, so Melissa, we got to get to, to your yep. testimony. Uh, I, I st strikes me that and we got Senator Bruce Anderson, who's been on the claims commission here. Uh, Mille Lacs Lake had uh, a lot of claims come in with when government governor uh, Dayton had shut down fishing in that area. I don't know if you have a similar claims or not, but you might want to look into it. Uh, uh, Someone's got to tell me how I don't know what different, to do. different, different uh, pathway. But but I mean, that is something we do have around here as well. Uh, Thank you. Melissa, welcome to our committee. Uh, Thank you. Tell us your last name, identify yourself for the record, and if you can keep it to two minutes, I appreciate you. you my name is Melissa Yucatel. I'm with Coral River Whitetails, and this is my husband, Steve, and he's actually going to speak today. <laughs> okay. Hi, and Mr. Chair. I'm Steve Yucatel, and members of the committee, thanks for letting me speak today. Um, Melissa asked me to speak on her behalf. So go, if gotta, you can get a little closer, Steve, it'd be, yep. it's a little hard to hear you. And uh, Sorry. What, what, what uh, Crow River is that? Crow Wing County. Yep, we're at Crow River Whitetails. We're over in uh, Candy Ohi County. Candy Ohi. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so uh, we Welcome. have a we have a deer farm and uh, we have a hunt preserve, and we've been in business since 2013. So uh, I had a whole spiel presented for you, but uh, I'm gonna cut that way down because I got two minutes. So um, all right, uh, thanks for hearing me today. Um, because of the DNR ban was implemented for 18 months, no harvest animals could be moved or sold until the fall of 2023. Uh, this resulted in a regulatory taking of our businesses. Um, I'll get to write what happened at my farm. Uh, we don't raise enough deer to supply for our hunts. Uh, no deer could be hauled to my farm because of the DNR movement ban. Uh, we couldn't offer hunts to our clients who were booked with us for fall hunts. We turned away clients who called the book fall hunts as we could not move deer. Those clients went elsewhere and we lost their business. Several of our clients booked months in advance and took vacation time from work. Many couldn't reschedule their vacation time. Our clients have lost faith in our ability to have stock for them next season and beyond. Our preserve business has been permanently damaged. Uh, what happened to the farmers that supply to us? A lot of deer farmers were scheduled to move during the time of the movement ban and they couldn't sell their bucks. They now have to hold them for another year and hope they can move them next fall. They now have the added expense and stress of keeping these animals for another year in addition to their usual farm expenses. They have the added risk of these animals dying before they can market them in the fall. They need to somehow make room on their farms for the extra animals that they didn't plan for. And with no income from sales, they need to figure out how they're gonna pay for their farm expenses for the next year my own feed costs have gone up 60% per ton in the last year. And unfortunately, this cost will be too much for a lot of farmers to bear. And there's no compensation to us for these losses. I'll keep it at that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. Um, members, any questions? Can I just say one thing? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Melissa. So, so when this movement ban was put on, um, we were, we were um, calling the Board of Animal Health frustrated, wondering what we could do. 
There, there's no permits given, there's no movement rights given. And what, what we did get back from the Board of Animal Health was um, a telephone number for a suicide hotline. Now, when the government shuts down your business and their answer to that is a suicide hotline, how do you think that makes us feel? So if that happened to your business, where would you be today? That's all I have. Very good. Thank, thank you so much for driving in uh, and sharing your story with us. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to know how many animals that uh, the Crow River um, whitetails have on their facility. Uh, Thank you for the question, sir. Mr. Yucatel, um, and to the extent you want to share, and it's probably public, I, I'm just go ahead to Senator Anderson. Uh, yeah, first. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, committee. Um, thanks for your question. Um, we have 130 animals on our farm premises right now. We also buy from 15 Mrs. other Yucatel. farms around us. So we not only have our herd, we have 15 other farms that transport to us. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, do you, um, it, it, does your population say pretty stable as far as 130, or does it vary throughout the, the uh, year from, say? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Committee, Committee. thank you for the question. Um, it fluctuates higher up in the spring. So, we'll have um, approximately, I think it's 39 bread doughs. Um, and so each one will have an average of two fawns. And so we can expect uh, 75 to 80 more animals in the spring. And then in the fall, when hunts come, they'll, the population will go back down and uh, harvest bucks will be harvested. And we'll hopefully be back down to about that 130 mark. It's a good number for the footprint of our breeding operation. Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson, uh, so right now though, the, with the ban on, uh, you can't do anything with, with your herd? Mr. Yucatel and Senator Anderson, I think the ban has now been lifted. Uh, I mean, prior to that. Mr. Yucatel. Um, thank you, Mr. What, what is your current state and, and prior to that, to Senator um, Anderson's question? Our, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Anderson, for your question. Um, that's a really good question. Um, at the time, on October 11th, when they put this ban in place, uh, the ban was actually uh, implemented for 18 months. Um, it was not told to anyone that they might possibly lift it sooner. Um, and that is what st struck really uh, a hard nerve there in the deer farming world. Um, knowing that we sell animals in the fall, from October 11th, 4th, uh, everyone planned that they, they couldn't sell in the fall of 2021 or the fall of 2022, and possibly not until the fall of 2023. So as a deer farmer, um, you have to make a, some difficult decisions knowing that you can't move animals for two years. Uh, and if your feed bill is already twelve or fifteen hundred dollars a month, and, and you have children, and you have other animals, and you have other <laughs> obligations that, quite honestly, uh, are very important, um, that was terrifying to a lot of young families. Uh, and I know that people just ended up having to make intelligent business decisions, and a lot of herds were put down. I'll, I'll just say it. So, Mr. Chair. Senator, Senator Anderson, thank you. Um, so with this new concurrent um, legislation that went into, into effect, how does that strike you in, in your dealings as a deer hunter or deer uh, provider? Uh, do you think that this is working well or did you like the way things were going prior to uh, this <laughs> concurrent re uh, resolution or concurrent legislation? Mr. Yucatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. And then um, Senator Gargan has a question. And then we go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I, from what I see, it's not necessary. It doesn't appear to be working well. Um, even when I, I was listening to 
Bob Meyer's testimony earlier, um, he said that the DNR will be taking over um, all inspections going forward. But when we asked Dr. Beth Thompson, will that be happening? We didn't hear an answer. So I'm not sure where they're at with that. I don't know for sure that I see the groups working very well together. Um, it's not necessary. Gary mentioned that the Board of Animal Health could have gotten more funding and that would have probably just solved all the problems right there. Um, but I don't work with these agencies at the Capitol or do all the things that they do. So it's a tough question for me to answer. But from my point of view, it doesn't seem that it's a good idea. But Melissa may want to speak on that too. I'd like to say something. Melissa, any comment on it? Then I need to get to so, Senator Gawk. So from my point of view, um, the Board of Animal Health did all their trace outs. They did it in a matter of hours. They knew where all of the animals were that were in that had been in Wisconsin, where they were in Minnesota. They had locked down them farms. None of that would have affected my business or the 15 other businesses that I work with, other than the DNR shutting it down. And they did it six weeks later. Um, I I still find it hard to believe that they learned it through the newspaper. Um, I think they just hostily shut it down during our prime time because they know they can do that. This is the third time they've done it. They seem to pose it for whatever reason they want, whether the CWD is coming from within the state or with out, outside of the state. And I'm kind of rambling, but that's just kind of my opinion on it. Um, they, for five animals, they blanketed the entire state. Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the question I have is, you had mentioned that uh, uh, deer were being put down. Did, did you put down deer yourself? Mr. Yucato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Goggin. Um, we did not need to. We're a self-sustaining farm pretty much. And so we have an outlet for our deer because we have a, a harvest preserve. Um, most farms don't have that. And so, um, and no one knew that the ban would be lifted in December. So that was kind of a surprise, but um, even farms that would have wanted to, or had an opportunity to sell to a, a preserve like me, uh, I canceled all my hunts. Uh, we couldn't get animals. So I called my hunters. It was the responsible thing to do and just say, hey, there's a movement ban. We won't be able to host you this year. I'm very sorry. And uh, we called our farmers and said, I'm sorry, we won't be able to buy your deer. We went ban. Um, so so um, we just did what we thought was responsible. But at our farm, we didn't have to put down any of our animals because of the ban. So we're one of the fortunate few. So thank you for the question. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Goggin. Uh, you said you had to cancel hunts. Roughly, what was the cost of that canceling uh, of the hunts on your property, if you know the numbers, Mr. Yukato, um, to the to the degree you want to share with us, I, yeah, yeah, I, I think the Senator it, God no, is not I, trying to ask for proprietary or confidential information, but some of it's probably publicly sure. shared anyway. So sure. what, whatever you. you're comfortable answering. Yep. Be, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Goggin. Um, we canceled um, approximately thirty hunts this year, and we're we're uh, a new farm preserve that are just getting started. So this one really hurt. But if I had to estimate our overall cost or loss at our farm. And I guess I would do it as a percentage versus dollar. So you don't have to oh, okay. any, well, any, um, any well, we lost We lost over half of our revenue this year because of that. We will not be profitable this year because of that shutdown. Thank you. So, that, that's all I have, Mr. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. You could tell. And Melissa, thank you as well for coming in. We appreciate uh, you taking the time. I know it's a, a little, not quite as far as Mr. Porter had to, but can do I still halfway across the state. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Members, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, so, so the plan is we're gonna go a little, little after, but not too long. Um, I, I wanna call the DNR back up, uh, Captain, uh, Robert, and uh, let you go through the report. I think that's probably where we're gonna end up stopping and then ask the Board of Animal Health to come in 
and, and give their testimony Wednesday members. We'll have room on the Wednesday agenda so we can start with this. Uh, that's where I plan to go. Um, some people are very quick to shut off questions, but members, uh, I always like the engagement we have. We learn a lot from the different testifiers. They drive a long ways. And so uh, I appreciate your indulgence, but I just am uh, trying to walk that balance. And uh, we always wanna make sure we have uh, good engagement and uh, when people make that long of a trip. And, and for those of you that are testifying, if we don't finish today and it doesn't work to come back, uh, you can join by Zoom, so contact our committee staff and we can get you a link so you could watch uh, any further discussion if that's easier or your desire on Wednesday, we'll continue this hearing. So uh, Captain, uh, identify yourself again for our record and let's uh, walk through your uh, the report uh, February 1st and uh, members uh, feel free to jot down questions. If we don't get to them all today, we can continue Wednesday. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Uh, Captain Robert Brecht, Minnesota DR. A little bit closer maybe would yep. be helpful. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's, that's better, thank you. So we'll give you a brief overview of what precipitated the, con con uh, the concurrent authority, kind of an overview of what we did during the concur concurrent authority, and then some of the uh, legislative audit report overview summary. All right, so how did we get here? So chronic wasting disease infections were confirmed or exposed in numerous areas across the state of Minnesota. Uh, nothing more uh, public than of course the Beltrami County deer farm herd, which uh, had CWD prions that were likely introduced to public lands by illegally dumping by the deer farm producer off of the farm and onto public lands. So with that, uh, as well as previous and then future, uh, as we talked about with this Maple Hills Farms, uh, incident during the concurrent authority. Uh, the uh, uh, deer farms obviously present a significant risk to CWD spread to the state of Minnesota. This is just a brief overview of what the legislature did last year. What I'd like to bring your attention to was what the legislative audit report was uh, tasked to do. And that was a summary of how the agencies work together under this section, including identifying any challenges an assessment of ongoing challenges to managing chronic waste and disease in the state, and then of course recommendations to statutory and pro programmatic changes uh, that would help the state better manage the disease. So what do we do? The DNR con uh, concurrent authority creates a CWD deer farm uh, co-management team with the Board of Animal Health. Uh, the DNR created a project plan to analyze the deer farming industry and all, all aspects of CWD and the, the risk of spread of CWD in relation to deer farms. So as of July 1st, 2021, there was approximately 176 white-tailed deer farms across the state of Minnesota. Currently, that number is less than 150. The DNR identified approximately a six-month goal to inspect a minimum of 40 deer farms, white-tailed deer farms, I should say, uh, across the state to kind of give us a sense of what the state of the state of deer farms is. All this information then would be compiled into this legislative report, which you guys were provided on February 1st. So I kind of equated to a crawl, walk, run. The DNR was getting uh, into the deer farm co-management business. Uh, we identified team leads with wildlife and enforcement division. Uh, this is not just an enforcement thing, but a wildlife thing as well. We did a review of statutes, administrative, uh, historical and case laws across uh, deer farms as well as CWD and the risk thereof. Uh, we attended numerous meetings with the Board of Animal Health coordinating on how are we going to really work concordant authority uh, starting out for this first six months. Of course, the other big thing for producers is biosecurity. We needed to get upfitted with PPE as uh, appropriate for the Board of Animal Health to make sure that we're not spreading that uh, CWD or that risk thereof when we're uh, visiting these farms. Uh, then we of course needed to identify DNR staff that will attend the deer farms, inspections with the Board of Animal Staff. So everything we did with the deer farms across the state, we did with a Board of Animal Health agent with us. We did nothing different. We were with them and we really wanted to see what this industry was all about from the Board of Animal Health agent perspective. So then we moved on to the walking stage. We created a deer farm inspection form to capture information and record data. We worked with Trace First, which is a company that uh, the Board of Animal Health currently contracts with for their records management system. We trained additional wildlife and enforcement staff to assist in doing it. Uh, at first, there was just a few of us. We trained in more staff to, of course, help cover better across the state. 
We then completed the purchase of a new DNR Board of Animal Health Core uh, One record management system in order to hold the white-tailed deer farm data separately from the rest of the Board of Animal Health data. That ended up being quite the concern uh, and problem for this concurrent authority. Their core one system manages all of their poultry, their swine, their bovine, all of their data that the DNR has no need or, act or need of access to. So the, the plan was to take an, uh, a mirror image, if you will, of their core one system and for simple terms, do a copy paste of just the white-tailed deer data to this new system. This of course took time, this took uh, funding for the Trace First company to create this system and then get everybody trained and do that. So as of February 1st, that system is now live um, and we do have access to that. Before that, uh, for the last couple of months, we've had read-only access to the white-tailed deer data, but we really wanted to partition that because we have no need for that other data. So now we're kind of to that run stage uh, we're getting more DNR uh, staff trained in learning the core one system. Again, that is a uh, animal health system, a herd tracking system that in incorporates all of the uh, herd, del uh, he herd health data as well as movement data across there, including any kind of violations, compliance issues, things of that nature. Uh, we're continuing to do white tail deer farm inspections until new direction is given by the legislature. And we're gonna train additional staff to assist in future white-tailed deer farm program until otherwise directed to do differently. That includes, of course, data entry, which is a very labor intensive task. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Additional inspection staff, and then technology computer staff as we move forward. So as we, we talked earlier uh, on uh, September 26th, the DNR was made aware, I'll breeze through this since we already discussed this, made aware of a, po a potentially CWD exposed uh, deers, deer that were imported from the state of Wisconsin into Minnesota. The Board of Animal Health uh, did confirm that three, de uh, three Minnesota deer farms had received deer. Uh, I believe that is correct, five deer, and most of those deer were either gone, dead, or were shipped back to the other state, except for the one. They did quarantine that, that one herd. Um, there was a risk of the 380 remaining deer shipped to other states, uh, and their disposition was ultimately unknown. Um, we did not get, and the Board of Animal Health did not get the records from Wisconsin on the trace outs until after the temporary movement order was put in place. Uh, furthermore, as Dr. Thompson explained, it is up to each of those individual states that Wisconsin had contacted to notify that information back uh, to what the status of those deer were. Unfortunately, there were several states that did not report back, including, and I feel like I'm picking on them, Oklahoma. Uh, they had a large portion of deer of that 380 some deer that were never reported back. And there is a, a split of responsibilities between those agencies at the Oklahoma Fish and Game as well as their equivalent of the Board of Animal Health. And due to differences in their tracking, we ultimately were unable to get the final dispositions of those deer. So if they got different deer tags or otherwise, um, we ultimately found out that we're just not going to find out that answer, which kind of highlights some of the risks um, when we're allowing importation from these states that don't keep the same records. Mr. Grecki? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Question, and then we might be at a, at a good natural pause, but do we know where the deer might have gone to in Oklahoma? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, the short answer is no. Some of these went to terminal hunt facilities. Some would have died on the on, on farms or other hunt uh, facilities of natural causes. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, no, we do not know the final dispositions of these deer or so most of them. Mr. Mr. Gorecki, if if they go to a hunt facility, uh, wouldn't it be pretty natural that they're going to be hunted and not moved out uh, except after they're dead? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes unless uh, as, as does happen, sometimes one hunt facility will sell a deer to another hunt facility for whatever business purposes they see. But uh, okay. yes, that is true. So, so Mr. Gorecki, um, I think we're on uh, slide number nine. Um, you've got a little ways further to go and I'm just trying to balance the time. Uh, if, if we bring it back up first thing at, on the Wednesday hearing, would that work for you to come back and finish your presentation? And then we wanna hear from the Board of Animal Health. And um, I think there's more here than, than we wanna rush through, if, if that's all right. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, whatever you guys deem. Yep. Okay. So, so members, any, any burning questions right now? Otherwise we'll take it back up Wednesday. Oh, Dr. Thompson, uh, I would like to 
just on any comments on the Oklahoma uh, animals uh, before we leave, and then members will will continue Wednesday. Dr. Thompson, if you could answer my question on that as well. Dr. Thompson? Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I, my, my question about the, the animals in Oklahoma, sounds like we don't know where they went. Any further insight you can share with us on, on animals that go to hunts, hunt preserves, or, or what, what happens to them? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Oklahoma is one of those states that has split authority, and, and I'm drawing from my memory banks here. It seems as though... Uh, their animal, state animal health official, Dr. Rod Hall, has oversight on chronic wasting disease for farm facilities, but then their equivalent of the Department of Natural Resources has oversight of animals in hunt facilities. Uh, as I mentioned to you, all state animal health officials, uh, we work with traceability every day, every species every day, diseases that we need to be tracing. My understanding, the concern from De Department of Natural Resources here in Minnesota is that the animals moved from Wisconsin to this hunt facility, and then there was a possibility that ear tags were, were taken out of those animals, and then at some point the animals came out of that hunt facility, were re-tagged, and moved into the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm not aware that that happens. Um, the testimony from DNR that hunt facilities trade animals back and forth. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, Mr. Chair, but I would find it very odd and, and they should be prosecuted if in fact this hunt facility is taking official identification out of animals, not tracking it, and then putting new official identification into the animals and moving them into other states. If you look at the official ID for animals, it's, there, there's a U.S. shield that is on the official ID, and it specifically says, do not remove. So that, that is punishable if they are removing and or not tracking and then putting new ID and to move them into to new states, Mr. Chair. Hmm. Insightful. Thank, thank you. Uh, members, with that, we will uh, leave on that note, and uh, we'll ask a the parties to come back uh, first thing on the agenda for Wednesday. Uh, members, uh, with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned.